Chicago. And unbeknownst to BCU at that time, these buildings had become a nationally important open air museum. Today's presenter, Charles Burnell, has helped us understand why these buildings matter and gifts from him and his sister Louise have helped the libraries in building its holdings of the documents to interpret these buildings. And for many of you, you may have seen the table in the back that has examples of some of this uh, material. And if you haven't been able to, please at the intermission or at the end, please stop by the table and take a look. Now, in 2015, Charles retired after 30 years teaching in Virginia at the University of Mary, Washington, UVA, and VCU. Today, he and Louise teach at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. Charles, er, Charles earned a ma uh, master's at the Winth Winther Museum and a doctorate at Columbia University. To name just one publication that has won national awards, Charles is the co-author of the Virginia Museum book, The Making of Virginian Architecture, the only general history on the subject. But Charles is prouder of having shaped a series of brilliant students at VCU. And his students' dissertations, theses, papers um, are mostly held here at Special Collections and Archives. And they're open to the public. And we welcome you to come take a look at them. In his retirement, if you can really call it retirement, I think, um, Charles collaborates on presentations with Louise, who served as the Maryland Historical Society Registrar during the period that Charles was at VCU. She did her graduate undergraduate work at the University of Texas, Michigan, and Delaware. In 2020, Louise and Charles uh, created a fund in spe for special collections and archives in memory of their mother, Bess T. Brunel. And they provided for this fund and their planned gift. Um, from the, for the libraries each year, they present a program every April um, where they share some thoughts on the VCU houses. And before I turn it over to Charles, I just really want to thank you for all that you've done to contribute to VCU libraries and special collections. So without any further ado, here's Charles and Artistic Mansions. Thank you, Crystal. And you're welcome, Crystal. Louise and I are really glad to have this audience in this room and on Zoom. But let's go. We like to ask, what's it for? And how's it put together? What is this event for? It's to invite you to enjoy some historic houses at VCU by looking, that takes us to our first thesis. VCU's Monroe Park campus is a unique, nationally important museum of architectural history. This museum urges us to think as a museum should. And now our second thesis, just one of the merits of this group is as a display of historic ornament. In 2022, we started a series on adorning mansions and saw some materials used to ornament the houses. In 2023, we looked at the most famous ornaments in architecture, the orders of column. That's in the main side of the classical tradition, the side of reasoning things out. We might have turned to the impact of the Renaissance master Palladio, but it was more useful to view the impact of his exact contemporary, Vignola. We used Vignola's staggeringly popular handbook for the Doric, the Ionic, the Corinthian, their capitals or tops, their shafts, and their bases. And we studied the ornaments on Franklin. Then we looked at the flip side of the classical tradition, the irrational side. That's the legacy of the other antiquity. The term comes from Dorothea Nyberg, a teacher of mine at Columbia. We saw 
the disappearing order. Vignola is the key popularizer of this ancient Roman idea. Here's his masterpiece, the Farnese Palace at Capuarola. And here from his book is the main door. And there's the capital of the pillar. The shaft disappears into the stonework. The base pops out at the bottom. This motif had far greater currency than we dreamed last year, as we'll see on Franklin Street. This year we go further with the other antiquity. We look at fantasy ornament and creatures from fable with this thesis, the irrational side of the classical tradition has proved just as enduring as the classical side. And this thesis, the irrational side of the tradition has given us one of our most valued design elements, the curved animal leg. And this thesis, the motifs of fantasy and fable began in princely and often sacred sources, but have descended to popular use. If you take away our thesis ideas and some delight in what we show you, the lecture will do its job. That's what today is for. How's it put together? There's a preface, a body, with an introduction and a focus on two houses, a closing, a five minute break, time for discussion, and in place of the tour that we used to do tips so you can go touring on your own. The two houses are the William J. Anderson house, it belongs to the late Victorian freestyles that broke away from the academic learning of the preceding four centuries. And second, an example of the reaction against the freestyles, Hunton House. It belongs to academic eclecticism or the manner of the Ecole de Beaux-Arts that is to a renewal of academic learning. And here we owe much to a brilliant colleague, Chris Novelli. As usual, without Chris, we couldn't do this lecture. We'll bring in other houses for comparison. Now, where are we in our event? We're in the preface. That means you, Louise and me, it, and them. You, we trust you got the handout. You just follow down the page. The handout goes through each step of the lecture. It lists the main ideas or theses and the main buildings we'll see. In the middle are illustrations. In the back, there's sources. That's you. Now, Louise and me. I've worked for years on Virginia architecture and I'm co-author of the award-winning standard book on the screen. While I taught at VCU, Louise served as registrar at the Maryland Historical Society. She and I now teach one course a year at the Virginia Museum in connection with those collections. This fall, we'll teach a class on a specialty of ours, the aesthetic movement of which the freestyle was a part. That's Louise and me. 
now it, our subject. In 1992, when I moved to VCU, I found that it, in the past, had bought whole streets of historic buildings. Some buildings appear in this standard guide, but just as thumbnails without names or dates. Professor Harwood's interior design students had begun studying these buildings, but there was still much left to explore. And as your source list says, and as Crystal just told you, most Brownell student papers are in special collections here at Cabell. By degrees, VC was putting them online. The most germane is this classic by Kerry Colhane, who earned a master's here and became a major preservationist in Manhattan. Uh, we can announce, I think it will in my throat, that after a long effort, Kerry has finished her doctorate at University College, London, with a spectacular thesis. Let's give her a round of applause. How many people start the PhD and how few finish? Next, them, the Cabell staff, has collaborated to make today happen. Kelly Gottschalk, Crystal Carpenter, Antonia Vassar, and off screen, off screen, Ryan Pander, who is way off screen, who controls IT and stands between us and chaos. You can see by their smiles why we love working with them. One more thanks to Ray Bonus, who lately retired as senior research associate. Among many debts, Ray has taught us the value of giving a lecture a mascot. This spring, our mascot is Bela, who will announce transitions to us. What's he for? He's a terracotta gargoyle or downspout. How's he put together? He's our first monster, or to use a kinder term, our first case of fantastic fauna. That is, Bela consists of parts that don't occur together in nature, such as bat wings, and feline paws. We'll show you where to find Bela later. Ah, uh, but to quote Bela, let's have the body. So it's out of the preface and into the body to the introduction. That means where and what we're talking about. Where? Well-to-do Richmonders that first lived downtown, by degrees fashion, moved west out Franklin Street. We owe our knowledge of how this happened, above all, to our late colleague, Tyler Potterfield, whose book you can read. What? The styles. <clears throat> In the ancient world, the Greeks and then the Romans developed various columns. These faded out during the Middle Ages. The Renaissance revived these columns. This was part of reviving what thinkers saw as the eternal laws of architecture, supposedly based on nature and reason. The Renaissance systematized the columns and named them the orders. For some 400 years, the orders were the chief ornament in architecture, the handout has an appendix on this. The furthest departure from this legacy came with the late Victorian freestyles, but that departure was by no means complete. 
in reaction, the renewed classicism of academic eclecticism cut quite a swath into the 20th century. But there's other ornament. Much of it is neither rational nor irrational. It's neutral. People like to look at pleasant things. That especially means what we'll call the sunshine trio. Flora, lovely women, cute children. That is pretty flowers, pretty ladies, pretty babies. To illustrate, let's go here to Milheiser House to the front parlor to the hearth. It has something called an art fireplace lining or fire bat made of cast iron. Smith and Anthony, a great Boston foundry, made this feature. Firebacks were meant to throw heat outward while delighting the eye and the spirit with the play of flames against beautiful surfaces. We'll view the sunshine trail on this fireback in a picture of it from a rare Smith and Anthony catalog in special collections. Crystal Carpenter has kindly volunteered to display this and other fragile documents for you to see on the table at the rear of the room. The first place in the Sunshine Trio goes to Flora. There's the classical garland or swag. And there's the curling spiky leaf of the classical acanthus plant. VCU has planted acanthus beds at Franklin and Schaefer. You can see the real thing. But the fireback acanthus is sprouting growths that aren't acanthus plants. There's fantasy even here. The other two members of the Sunshine Trio are here the cute child, the pretty woman. The two elements of fantasy that concern us loom large, the impossible structure and fantastic fauna. Mother and child sit in an impossible structure. There's a hefty frame. It rests impossibly on fragile scrolls that turn into those insubstantial leaves, the frame spreads into moldings that look as if they should support the swags, but really don't. Up top, there's an architectural motif, a gable or pediment, but it's made of leaves and it turns into a face. The motif of a disembodied face is called a mask. There's more crazy structure at the sides. There, fantastic fauna, well, and a rosette rests on the noses and chins of two beasts with feline heads, the wings of birds, and bodies that trail off into leaves, and, and so on. Impossible structures and monsters were part of the classical tradition, and at times they submerged the reasonable motifs. So, that's the introduction. And Bela says, let's fly. To our first house. At this corner, where an almost matched pair of mansions frames the view. The houses belong to Ron Nixon, one of the best neighbors VCU could have. On your right is 
the Whitehurst House, which Ron has restored, on your left is the Anderson House, which Ron is <clears throat> bringing back from neglect. That house is part of the VCU family by adoption. For years, VCU rented the first floor. The house was built for William J. Anderson, president of the once mighty Richmond Stoveworks. And here is a rare trade card for that firm from Special Collections. The house is in one of the free styles called the Richardsonian style, or less aptly, Richardsonian Romanesque. The names refer to the inventor of the style, the great H. H. Richardson of Boston. The style has scant connection to the Romanesque style of medieval Europe. The there, Richardsonian Romanesque, a term it's better not to use. The free styles fuse inspiration from many sources freely. Definitely not a revival. At this building, where should we look? There's an old hierarchy in the parts of buildings. The front of Louise's house and the front of my house are nicer than the backs. That might be true of your house, too. Let's see the hierarchy at this house. The front of the house has the most expensive elements. Carved stone, stained glass, big sheets of costly polished convex glass. As we move around the side, materials and workmanship grow simpler and cheaper. In the service wing, we find small panes of slightly irregular original glass and brickwork that gets cheaper and cheaper. You can see the seam where the cheapest brick starts on the back wall. The hierarchy is especially true with historic houses outside and in. Now, the fantasy. The tower is richly carved with one, two bands or friezes. These bands are alive with creatures. But what are they? Here, the leaves turn into a goat-like face, like a classical satyr. But satyrs have goat ears and horns, not leaves growing out their heads. There is a medieval tradition of leaf faces that have come to be called the green man, but those faces aren't like satyrs. And who's this? Then, here's a bird-like creature with a crest and an open beak inspired by Asian phoenixes. Uh, Louise pointed this out. <clears throat> But clearly, uh, the Anderson being is more plant than bird. These beings are fantastic fauna or monsters. We leave it to you. How many creatures can you find in these friezes? Do take a look on your own. We suggest that they're meant for fun. This period is the first in the US when humor was a major trait in ornament. Another trait was a love of compositions of random seeming images. And there may also be a poetic appeal to the imagination here. Mm. But we don't see a purely free play of things. The basis of these friezes is a standard classical motif 
the rasso. A rasso is a band of leaves that scroll up and down and up in a regular pattern. Usually a rasso is just leaves and maybe rosettes. It can have figures creeping through it, but the real issue is a band of leaves that curl up and down regularly. But the Anderson Carver has exploded out of the regularity. Well, the front of such a house is at the top of the outside hierarchy. The main rooms for entertaining are at the top inside, and traditionally, the monarch of such rooms is the fireplace. In we go to the reception hall. We'll use shots made last spring with the work in progress, and first the chimney piece. We'll skip the overmantel and the tiles around the fireplace. At the sides are monsters. Here's a lion's head on a torso of leaves over just one leg, stylized as a scroll, and that leg turns into just one lion's paw. That's fantasy. Like the Rousseau, these one-legged creatures have a venerable classical pedigree. They are called monopods, from the Greek mono, just one, and pod, foot. But wait, Ron Nixon showed us that the lion has wings, and more important, two more paws. We've never seen that. With three paws, this can't be a monopod. It must be a triopod to coin a word. Well, and now just a nod to the winged beastie in the middle. But we move on to the front parlor. The chimney piece reigns supreme. Our sunshine trail pops up. A pretty woman, <clears throat> pardon me, and Flora, and monsters, <clears throat> but we want to look in a special place. The main hearths in such houses typically had firebacks. The choice of motifs was broad. They could be geometric patterns, literary subjects, scenes from myth, and so on. Uh, for instance, down the street lived the McAdamses, or the family sitting room, most likely for fun, they picked a really dizzy demon, all horns and fangs and claws, who seems to sprout from leaves and scrolls. Two blocks away, just around the corner from this room, lived Gilbert Hunt, a contractor who may have built these houses and no doubt designed his own. For his parlor fireback, firebacks, he picked fantastic fauna for the front parlor, the so-called green man. The motif is better called a leaf mask or foliate mask. In understanding these firebacks, we're much indebted to Dr. Craig Reynolds, whose VCU thesis covers the firm that made most of VCU's firebacks, the firm of Scanlon and Company. Craig's work led Louise and me to give special collections a most rare Scanlon catalog. There. And Crystal has put it out for you to see. That's it. We're also indebted to 
an issue of this journal. The issue helps sort out the story of the legendary green man and the leaf mask. And Professor Hutton's article is invaluable. Now, let's get back to the Andersons. In the front parlor, they got what is today another rarity, this fireback by an unknown maker. It centers on a demonic mask made of leaves. This amusing face suggests the impact of Christopher Dresser, the influential British designer. Dresser's books endorsed such motifs, and here is a mask design that he offered as humorous. One of the choicest recent acquisitions at the Virginia Museum is a dresser vase in the same vein. Well, we've had a taste of the freestyle. Now, how about just a bite? of the academic, eclectic reaction at our second house, which was built for a founder of the law firm of Hunton and Williams. The architect was William Noland, and the expert on Noland is Chris Novelli. At the Hunton House, we're seeing the renewal of academic learning and best behavior. The renewal of the classical tradition is most obvious in the porch, a colonnade inspired by the Renaissance. The order is quite logical, as we saw with the orders last year. There's a base that spreads as if to receive the weight it supports, a shaft that tapers from heaviest on the bottom to lightest at the top and swells a little as if in response to the weight that it supports and a capital that spreads still more for the same reason. This is pretty staid. But just behind are things that are not staid. The pilasters along the walls. In 2021, we showed how finely these are chiseled from excellent Indiana limestone. They were costly, something to take seriously. But the carvings don't behave seriously. Look, there's three feline legs supporting a vase that sprouts leafage. From the leaves spring cornucopias precariously poised on their tips. And then more leaves and another vase. And on that vase, dolphins balance still more perilously on their chins while they turn into leaves and flowers, and so on. I didn't. There, the leaves, the flowers, the arrows, and so on, all the way up to the top, which bursts into a flaming torch. This is impossible structure. We've already seen such a thing at Millheiser House. In a freestyle house, such liberty shouldn't surprise us. But Hutton House belongs to a renewal of classical values. If we ask what's up, we can answer that these crazy details are in fact a learned handling of Renaissance decoration. They're here as part of a style. And this isn't the largely free pay free play of imagination like the Anderson friezes. This design rests on standard features. Here is a page of Renaissance detail in a book from William Nolan's office. That book tells us, shows us just how standard such things were. And the long ancestry of this decoration goes back to the other antiquity. In antiquity, the father of Western architectural theory condemned such ornament. His name was Vitruvius. He worked for Julius Caesar. 
He wrote the only complete architectural treatise known from antiquity. He attacked fantasy ornament as against nature. And we quote this in the handout. The point is his line, such things do not exist and cannot exist and never have existed. So they shouldn't appear as decoration. We know specimens from Vitruvius world, from houses and tombs that were buried underground and we discovered starting in the Renaissance. Here's one that was once well known. There's griffins, beasts unknown to mother nature. In a method of support unknown to nature, they balance growths unknown to nature on their heads, vases, and from the vases grow buds, from which more buds grow, from which spring more vases, which support urns, which sprout leafage. Higher up are two more beings unknown to nature, part human, part plant, and so on. The proper name for this phantasmagoria is the grotesque. That means the fantastic decoration that survived in Roman buildings buried in underground rooms called grottos in the Renaissance. The popular meaning there from the word grotto, the popular meaning of grotesque today is distorted or unnatural. Now we can turn to that vital source, the Oxford English Dictionary, available online from Cabell Library. And we learned that today's popular meaning grew out of the unnatural quality of the decorative motif. The grotesque is often sloppily called the arabesque. This is at least partly because the word grotesque got those grim meanings. The arabesque grew out of the grotesque, but differs sharply. As its name says, it developed in the Arab world, or more accurately, <clears throat> pardon me, I only have to get in front of a microphone and I sound like something that crawled out of a crypt with a monster. We can go to a pearl among these used houses, the house built by the philanthropist Louis Ginter. We go to the former dining room to see fine arabesque grills. These were beautifully, here, here, come back, here are the grills. And a little closer. And closer still. These were beautifully analyzed by Leila Prasser Tritaya, a VCU student who became a VCU librarian. Layla wrote an eye-opening study of Islamic motifs on campus. Today's event has prompted the library to put Layla's study online. Like the grotesque, the arabesque is based on plant forms. Like the grotesque, it's open to infinite variations. The plant forms, though, are still further from nature. At times, they don't look like plants at all. They eliminate animate life, and the arabesque can curl in any direction endlessly, but the grotesque can spread only up or to the sides. Now, back to the grotesque and our thesis that the crazy side of the classical tradition has proved as lasting as the rational side. Over the years, some purists have followed Vitruvius and shunned fantasy. Many more designers have embraced the fantastic. We can peek inside Caprarola. The decorations done under Vignola's supervision include wonderful Renaissance grotesques. What is holding that platform up? When the Renaissance revived the classical tradition, it revived this other side of antiquity too. 
You can find all the grotesques you want in the centuries since the Renaissance. In Richmond, that means from downtown to Maymont at VCU. Haunted House isn't the only place, but we'll let you look. Here's a grotesque that you'll spot if you're on your toes. We're not done with the hunting porch. It still has two original benches. They take us back to monsters. These benches are part scrolls, part leaves, part motifs based on scales. And look here. Here are five fat toes with claws. To understand this concoction, we must look at our thesis that the irrational side of the classical tradition gave us the animal leg. One of the basic ways to make furniture is with curved animal legs. They can be fancy or plain, or really they can be fancy or less fancy. The custom began thousands of years ago, but we'll go back just to 1000 BC. And again, we owe to Layla Prasutwataya, who opened up some of the story in a fine symposium paper. She took us to the Near East, the home of countless kinds of fantastic fauna. We go to Lebanon for the sarcophagus of King Ahiram. The sarcophagus shows his furniture. And that blends Near Eastern and Egyptian traits. And here we've also used the work of a great scholar, Edith Parada. A high room sits on a princely throne. We think that through most of history, only privileged people have sat on a raised seat with a back or a raised seat with arms. More than princely, this throne involves the sacred. It's held up by sphinxes, in this case, part woman, part bird, part, whoops, part lion down at the leg. The fantastic fauna of the Near East and Egypt originated as supernatural guardian figures with the powers of the creatures of which they consisted. Moreover, in this case, Professor Parada tells us that the Sphinx throne was a conventional way to claim that in death, a Hiram became more than human. The front of the Sphinx shows us the basis of the animal leg outline. Out of the top, in, out at the paw. That's fancy. Now, less fancy. The table shows how easily animal legs can be reduced to S-curved scrolls. And here the leg has become an S-curve, one of the most common furniture supports on Earth. Over the centuries, the curved animal support has flourished in thousands of variations. And the form that began as sacred and royal became a middle-class commonplace. Fancy version. Here's a standard Roman table. The beasts are griffin monopods, a mix of feline and bird. And there's the curve, out, in, out. The Renaissance took up the form. Fancy. Here's the princely table that Vignola designed for the Farnese's palace in Rome. The end fauna are sirens, part human, part bird of prey, part lion, 
with the Kansas tails and the curve out in, out at the paw. And we have to tip our cap to the uh, <clears throat> satyr at each end with wings that are partly based on bat wings and partly based on butterfly wings. The Baroque and the Rococo developed our theme from the 18th century. Here's the Baroque turning playfully into the Rococo on a fine French table on loan to the Virginia Museum. The S-curved animal leg is now called a cabriole leg, ultimately from the word for goat. What counts with us, though, isn't the name, but that profile. Out under a satyr's head, in, out with the canthus instead of paws. For something less fancy, still in the 18th century, here's a piece made in Virginia in the phase of the Baroque called Queen Anne. In a more modest colonial economy, the cabriole leg is fairly plain. And by now, you don't need arrows. For the 19th century, the Virginia Museum has an array of animal leg Victoriana, like this stellar sofa. And you know that curve. In the 20th century, for academic eclecticism, there's VCU Scott House with an original marble bench, which echoes ancient and Renaissance pieces. This bench has lively creatures, including these beasts romping away. But what concerns us is the bottom. Here's a standard kind of seat found in countless places with S-curved legs with the acanthus curves down into lion paws. Standard. But at this date, it seems some people had grown tired of such bench forms and pushed the unreasonableness further like the maker of the hunting seats. The S-curved legs of the standard bench are there, but oddly, the paws and claws have crept up top. Not unique. You could see more non-standard benches like this in Hollywood Cemetery. And you can still buy the standard kind of bench with those legs in durable concrete or acrylic at many fine stores. More to the point, with the Hunton House, we can see the rooms as they were, thanks to a thesis by Victoria Carter, and thanks to the Huntons who shared their photos with Victoria. Like thousands of homes, this house was full of furniture with animal legs. We can peer from the front drawing room into the rear one. There's an empire style sofa. The family still has it with S curved lion paws. The other animal legs are less fancy cabrioles, a table, a stool, a mirror base, maybe the piano, and part of a set of Victorian chairs. We'll finish Hunton House with this point. The academic ornament is on best behavior. The front drawing room is lost, but we can go to the rear drawing room, which survives as a seminar room for the psychology department, and in we go.
over the chimney piece. The detail is lush, but disciplined. A splendid Corinthian order governs the wall. Flora, that sunniest member of the Sunshine Trio, is everywhere. The Rinceau has reverted to regularity. In contrast to the Andersons, and so it's quite regular. Most telling is what's on the hearth. A fireback, yes, but adorned only with fleur de lis, the demure opposite of the rambunctious Anderson piece. Now, a closing. You know how this lecture was put together? You have the thesis in the handout. And you know what today is for, to promote your pleasure in exploring. So we must listen to Bela. See you in five minutes. <laughs>